Brunsum, the Netherlands. A town situated in a picturesque woodland landscape and a town tainted with a dark secret. An 11-year-old summer camp attendee would suddenly vanish, his body only being found a few days later. It wouldn't be until 20 years later that this unsolved case would find justice and closure. How did the authorities break a case that haunted this Netherlandish town for two decades? And most importantly, who was responsible? People say Ted Bundy didn't show any emotion. I showed emotion. Before we delve into this case, I'd just like to talk about the sponsor for today's episode and give a massive thank you to the people over at Ridge for helping to keep this channel afloat. The Ridge wallet is an amazingly light and sleek wallet made specifically to hold cards and designed beautifully to fit into any pocket. With two metal plates held together by a durable elastic band, it's super easy to fit the cards you need for your day-to-day -day ventures inside side and to only take the cards you need with you. So it's time to throw out your old bulky wallets and switch to this amazing, incredible slimline wallet. The Ridge wallet comes in a large range of colors and styles, including carbon fiber, aluminium, and titanium. So you are sure to find a wallet that'll suit anyone in your life. It makes a great Christmas present. And the kind people over at Ridge have hooked you all up with a little holiday deal. Head on over to ridge.com forward slash Joshua, choose from their stunning line of wallets and make sure you use code Joshua to get 10% off at checkout. Again, thank you to Ridge for sponsoring this episode. And with all that being said, let's delve right into this case. The morning of the 10th of August 1998 started out as any other at the summer camp in Bransom, Netherlands. The kids woke up to the birds chirping in the trees and the cold morning air surrounding them. They ate their breakfast around the still warm ashes of yesterday's campfire before getting ready for a day of outdoor pursuits and enjoying themselves as kids normally do. After a day jam-packed with fun activities in the surrounding areas, the children ate their dinner around the campfire before retiring to their tents at around 10 p.m. The day seemed just as normal as any other for the children within that camp. That was until 11-year-old Nicky Verstappen was reported missing from his tent. He was reported missing by one of the children who had been sharing a tent with him and four other boys. When this child was asked when the last time he had seen Nikki was, he responded by saying that Nikki had still been in the tent when he got up at around 5am to go to the toilet. But when he awoke fully in the morning by the excited voices of other children heading to fetch breakfast at around 9am, he noticed that Nikki wasn't in the tent with him. This didn't immediately alarm the boy as he just assumed that Nikki had already left the tent to go get some breakfast. But when he ventured out to get himself some food, he noted that Nikki was nowhere to be seen. The child, unsure of where Nikki could have been, told one of the camp counselors that Nikki was no longer in the tent and he couldn't be found anywhere around the camp. The weirdest thing about this was that Nikki's shoes were still by the side of his sleeping bag, untouched. Nikki Verstappen was an 11-year-old boy born on the 13th of March 1987 to parents Berthy and Peter Verstappen. He was a happy child who was loved by his family and had many friends. 
Two days before he went missing, on Saturday the 8th of August 1998, Nikki and 26 other children took a bus from the village of High Bloom to the De Heikop camping ground in Brunsummerheide. This was a big step for Nicky, as the previous year he had actually signed up to attend the same summer camp, but had backed out at the last minute due to fears of being too homesick. But this time round, he was determined to go to camp. Even with his best friend, who was supposed to be attending the same summer camp with Nicky pulling out at the last second while they were waiting to board the bus to the campsite, Nicky was still set on going. Nicky stood his ground and pushed on without his friend and joined the other 26 children on the bus looking forward to his time camping and exploring the outdoors. The day that Nicky was reported missing to the camp counsellors, it actually took them a really long time to admit that he was missing. They kept brushing it off, saying that he must be around somewhere and that he probably just got a bit lost while out exploring. Nikki's parents knew that he hadn't just gotten lost or was out exploring as they knew just how homesick he was being so far away from them for long periods of time. That fact alone would have ensured that Nikki stayed in the camp to make sure that if he wanted to come home, he could quickly ask a counsellor to call his parents. As a matter of fact, when Nikki's parents were eventually called about him being missing, they assumed at first that the call was a counsellor calling to get them to pick him up as he didn't want to stay there anymore because he was homesick. It wasn't until the 11th of August 1998, the day after Nikki was last seen, that the police and a group of volunteers set out to search for him. This search operation included police planes, canine units, and a vast number of volunteers from surrounding areas who had seen the posters that the camp counsellors had posted locally the previous day. At 9pm, the evening after Nikki had gone missing, search teams discovered something that would turn the Verstappen family's lives into a living nightmare. Nikki's body was found in a grove of pine trees, just a short walk away from the campsite. He was found naked from the waist up and with his pyjama bottoms on, back to front and inside out. The area where Nicky had been found was slightly off the road and hidden behind the thick branches of the Christmas trees that were growing there. This spot was known locally as a place where homosexual men met up for discreet hookups, as the thick branches and isolated location made it easy to not be seen. Despite Nikki's remains being found within such a short period of time, just two days after last being seen, medical examiners and detectives working this case were unable to distinguish a conclusive reason for his death. Nikki has sustained no major injuries. He hadn't been stabbed or shot or anything violent like that. In the pathologist's reports, there were only a few conclusive points made apparent. The first point in this report was that Nikki's body had actually been staged after his death, leading detectives to believe that where he had been found wasn't the location in which he had actually died. His feet were completely clean. No scratches, dirt or leaves were present on the soles of his feet, which indicated that he hadn't set foot on the floor of the pine grove where his body was found. The second point was that no other external traumas were present on his body, bar the discovery of rectal trauma. We won't delve into that trauma any further. And the final point on the pathologist's report was that he had likely died due to asphyxiation, though it was unknown how exactly he had been deprived of oxygen. The pathologist determined it likely that whoever had sexually assaulted Nicky had killed him unintentionally by covering his mouth and nose to stop him from making noise. Then after they realised that he was dead, the perpetrator promptly searched for a spot to hide the body and decided that in the trees just off the road would be the best place. DNA samples were taken from Nicky's trousers and underwear, and when the detectives ran these samples through their database, they were unable to find a match. With no DNA match or witnesses, there was just a big question mark hanging over the case, as nothing could be found or uncovered to move the case forward. There were no leads. The police were stumped. 
On the night that Nicky's body had been discovered, the police secured the crime scene where he was found and placed a pair of military personnel standing guard so that they could protect the scene. One of these guards was Euron Servers. He was on his first job with the military police and he was determined to do a good job. Unfortunately, Euron would be unable to see the role that he played in the solving of this case play out as he was sadly killed during active duty in Iraq in 2004. His father spoke out about how proud he was of his son's involvement in cracking this case, stating, quote, We are very proud that Yuron had responded so adequately. He was very precise in his work. Yuron and his colleague were standing watch over a nearby road to the crime scene when they encountered a man who had been cycling up and down the road. Yuron found this behaviour to have been suspicious and asked the man for his reason for cycling around the area at night. The man responded that he was delivering leaflets to the scout camp and because of the heat of the day, he found it easier to accomplish this task in the evening when it was cooler. But Euron didn't believe this man's story. He thought it to have been very suspicious, so he took down the man's information. This man was Joseph Theresia Johannes Breck, better known as Joss Breck. Joss Breck was born on the 29th of October 1962. He lived in the village of Simpelveld, which was just a 16 minute drive away from the De Heikop campsites where Nicky had been staying. He was well known in the local area for being a big survivalist and being someone who enjoys living off nature, which luckily for him was something he was surrounded by in Simpleveld. He would regularly go off into the wilderness alone and spend weeks or even months just living off the land. Because of this passion, he regularly volunteered to help out local groups, including the scouts, to help them with their outdoor pursuits and lessons on edible plants and fungi. During the time after Nikki's body was discovered, many people who lived locally were interviewed by the police in relation to the case. This included Joss Breck, who at the time was pretty low on the police's suspect list. Further to these interviews, the police also informed the German authorities of the case as the campsite that Nikki had been staying in was fairly close to the German border. Due to this, the police involved with the case believed that a suspect would be highly likely to try to flee the country quickly to avoid detection, and with the German border being the closest to the scene of the crime, it would have been likely that the perpetrator would try to cross into Germany. There isn't much information available as to why these people were interviewed in connection to this case by the police. There was no information available to say a solid reason why they did interview these people, but it wouldn't be hard to assume that they had some sort of criminal history that the police believed could be linked to this case. There were a few people who the police were immediately interested in, and between December 1999 and January in the year 2000, 35 men took part in DNA testing. After running extensive DNA tests, the results came back. And unfortunately, none of these suspects' DNA matched with the DNA samples found on Nikki on Nikki's pajama bottoms. There is very little information available online in either speculation or in any official report stating an actual timeline for Nikki's disappearance. No one knows when Nikki left his tent or how he ended up deceased in the Pine Grove. Was he lured away by someone he knew? After all, he hadn't caused the scene or made any noise. Perhaps he knew the perpetrator. Or was he taken from his tent in his sleep? Maybe he only awoke from sleep when it was too late to shout for help. Detectives determined it to have been highly unlikely that someone ventured into camp and chose a child out of all those tents surrounding the campfire without waking someone else or without someone seeing something or hearing something. This theory, though, cannot be completely debunked. Unfortunately, we will never know the whole truth of what happened to Nikki on that fateful night. And by the end of the year 2000, just two years after Nikki was found, the case of Nikki Verstappen had turned cold. In 2003, three years after this case went cold, a famous Dutch crime reporter, Peter de Vries, brought this case back into the public eye. 
On his show, he produced an entire segment on Nikki, including a reenactment of the search for the boy and a more in-depth look into the camp and its counselors. Unfortunately, I couldn't find an accurate English translation of this segment, so I don't know the full extent of the information that was shown, but we did discover some facts. On this show, Peter found out that some of the camp leaders had been convicted of or suspected of child molestation. Even more shockingly, the head of the camp that Nikki had been attending, Josh Barton, was one of the staff members who had been previously convicted of crimes against children. Even though his conviction had been in the 50s, over 40 years before this case, it still seems odd to me that he was allowed to still be the head of this children's camp. This previous conviction wasn't the only reason that Yosh became a suspect in Nikki's case. An incident that had occurred just a week before the crime raised some major red flags. The week before, on the 5th of August 1998, at the very same camp, a 15-year-old girl had complained to the camp counsellors that she was suffering with a headache. Upon hearing this, they gave her some sleeping pills, and the girl woke up the next morning in the staff tent with abdominal pains and no recollection on how she got into the staff tent. She suspected that she had been raped while she had been unconscious due to the sleeping pills, and she suspected that her rapist had been Josh Barton. Once investigators had learnt of this, the police tried to get him to give them his DNA so that they could compare it against the samples found on Nikki's body but he categorically refused to cooperate with the police. And as a result of this, he became the number one suspect in the eyes of the public. Yosh was 85 years old by the time this case was revisited, and he actually eventually passed away, closing off this lead in the case, taking his secrets to the grave. In 2010, family members of Yosh gave the police permission to exhume his body and take a DNA sample to compare against the DNA samples found on Nikki. And after the results came back, the police were thrown back to square one. The results didn't yield anything that the police had anticipated. They weren't a match. Investigators were forced to turn their attention towards their other main suspect, the German serial killer Martin Ney. Martin Ney had murdered three children and sexually assaulted at least 40 others in school summer camps. He was active between the years of 1992 and 2004 and mainly targeted 10 to 11 year old boys making his MO a perfect match for Nikki's case. However, the areas that Martin Ney usually frequented were around a six hour drive away from the camp that Nikki had been staying in which meant that it was highly unlikely that he had been in the area. There's nothing to say he had been. Investigators were once again at a loss, and this again meant that the case of Nikki Verstappen had gone cold. Even with Nikki's case going cold, Peter de Vries, the investigative journalist who had featured Nikki's case on his television program, still continued to campaign to keep Nikki's name in the public eye. For over 20 years, Peter posted articles, interviews, and appeared on TV shows trying to keep the story of this poor child remembered. And it was as a result of Peter's campaigning and Nikki's parents' campaigning that this case would find closure. Over the years, Peter and Nikki's parents, Berthy and Peter Verstappen, had become good friends. They became such good friends that Peter became a person with whom they could rely on, and it was stated that Peter took hundreds of calls from the Verstappens over the years. Peter even had Nikki's favourite football club's shirt hanging in his office. He'd actually ordered it to go in Nikki's tomb, but it arrived too late, so he had hung it up in his office as a reminder to keep on fighting for justice. In 2005, the police started looking further into the DNA found on Nikki's body, and in 2008, they found a strong piece of DNA evidence which would be capable of being properly tested with new DNA profiling techniques. With this strong piece of DNA, they ran it against literally everyone who would have come into contact with Nikki over that day at the summer camp. This included all the kids he shared a tent with, the camp counsellors, and many other kids who had attended the camp. Sadly, this round of profiling didn't yield any results. The DNA found on Nikki's remains were still unidentified. 
But this did indicate that this DNA was extremely probable to be that of Nikki's killer. It wasn't anyone he had come into contact with at the campsite. It wasn't one of the other kids or anything like that. If the investigators could figure out whose DNA it was, they could finally close this case. The DNA was then run through the National DNA Database and no matches were found. It's important to note that in 2005, some notes were left on Nikki's grave in the High Bloom Cemetery. These notes suggested that the writer had a potentially larger understanding of what had happened to Nikki the night of his murder than he should have done. Over a year later, in 2006, the man responsible for these letters was apprehended and questioned by the police. During the questioning, it became quickly apparent that this man knew nothing about the case and was actually a psychiatric patient who believed he knew the truth. Shortly after the police released him, he stumbled upon a column that had been erected when Nikki's body had been found and smashed it with a hammer and threw paint all over it. This column was erected on the 8th of June 2001 by Nikki's family as a memorial, as a way of remembrance. In 2012, 14 years after Nikki's body had been found, a new independent cold case team was handed the case. This new team were not planning on reopening the case, but were there to give the case a fresh set of eyes to see if anything had been previously missed. This same team had been at the forefront of a new DNA profiling technique, which could determine a DNA marker from a familial link, meaning that a suspect could be found if a member of their family was DNA tested. It can also determine what familiar link you have with the person who had been tested. This technique blew the doors wide open for this case, as the police knew that it would be only a matter of time until the DNA technology was evolved enough to be a helping hand in this case. It would seem like that time had finally arrived. In 2017, 1,500 people were invited to cooperate in the first step of a large-scale DNA investigation. Before this DNA investigation begun, the public prosecutor stated that this might be the, quote, last real possibility to solve this case. This first step asked the men who appeared on the cold case file to voluntarily submit DNA to the screening process. This was done in an attempt to finally trace the profile of the DNA found on Nikki's remains. It was announced in January of 2018 that 21,500 men in the Limburg province of the Netherlands would be asked to give samples of their DNA, after the first round of DNA sampling came back with no matches. By the end of this period, only around 14,000 people had come forward voluntarily to be tested. Even with just over half of the wanted samples being taken, this was still the biggest DNA sampling that had ever taken place in the Netherlands. This was the moment they had been waiting for. After comparing all the DNA profiles against the one found on Nikki, they finally had a match. This was a family match to a name previously mentioned in this episode, Jose Breck. Jose Breck was the man that had been stopped on the road by those two military personnel the day after Nikki's body had been found. He had also been previously interviewed by the police, but had been let go as he had a solid alibi at the time. When the police looked closer into the background of Jose Breck, they found that in 1985, a 22-year-old Joss Breck was a suspect in a sexual abuse case. This case involved four boys being sexually abused in Limburg, and Joss Breck had actually confessed this assault. Shockingly, even with this confession, Joss was never arrested for the crime. So 13 years before this case, before Nikki's case, Joss was known for assaulting young boys, but he was never prosecuted for it. There was a reason that this didn't come up on the police records when they had first looked him up. In 1998, when he was interviewed by the police, they only did a basic search on him. And in the Netherlands, at the time, if you'd been a suspect in a case but had never actually been charged, after so many years, it would be removed from your record. This meant that until the police did a more thorough search of Josh Breck in 2018, they had no record of this arrest even existing. A few months before the family DNA was found to match Joss's family member, he had been reported missing. A like-minded friend of Joss, named Angelo, who knew of Joss through their love of bushcraft, had found his mobile left in his cabin. 
Now, this was a strange occurrence, even though Joss wasn't much for technology. He usually took a mobile with him in case he needed to get into contact with someone, whether that was just his mother to check in or one of his friends if he needed help. Joss's chalet was his last known place of residence, and fellow bushcraft enthusiasts would regularly stop off here to rest for a night or to catch up with Joss if he was home. Angelo told police, quote, I thought, God damn it, now Joss had started a three week hike while it is minus 20, but now we know why he left his phone there. After finding this phone in his chalet, Angelo and some of their friends set off to find Joss, hoping that they wouldn't find him dead. They ended up searching for Joss over three months, with many acquaintances stepping in to help from across Europe. They even brought in sniffer dogs to help them on their treks. By this point, they realized that Joss had packed lightly, so he was able to easily survive off the land and easily able to cover his tracks. Angelo reported him missing to the police, who promptly told him that, quote, they wouldn't be looking for Joss. He was a grown man, they said, not a child, not a criminal either. A few months later, the police were kicking themselves as they now knew that this person that they had dismissed was actually a wanted criminal and someone who was highly suspected in their case. Joss had been in contact with his family until February of 2018 when he told them that he was going hiking in the mountains. And by April 2018, they had reported him as missing. Within a few months, Joss had been reported missing twice, and the police were only now starting to take notice. Finally taking the missing reports for Joss Breck seriously, they began the hunts to find him. They started in his last known place of residence, his chalet in France. At the chalet, the investigators determined that he had not returned to that address for a considerable number of months. The police realized that the previous time he was reported missing by Angelo, nearly four months prior, was the last time he had been seen by anyone. Within the chalet, authorities located a pair of Joss's pajama bottoms. They decided to test the clothing for DNA, and as it turns out, it was a 100% match to the DNA found on Nikki's body. The police finally had their man in their sights. The only thing left for them to do was to track him down. A Europe-wide search for Joss had been launched, and people were encouraged to call a helpline that had been set up to handle any calls or tips that might be helpful in his capture. Photos of Joss were released to the public, along with last known addresses and any recent information that could be useful. The police received thousands of tips, with around 75% of these being to do with the possible whereabouts of the now 55-year-old Joss Breck. Eventually, a Dutch man living in the Spanish town of Castella Ter Sol placed a call to the tip line. This man stated that he had spoken to Joss several times before the images of him and the warrant arrest was mentioned on the news. Authorities rushed to the Spanish town and they hit the jackpot. Finally, after weeks of searching, they had their man, and he was arrested on suspicion of the murder of Nicky Verstappen. Joss was found in an isolated wooded area about 50 kilometers away from Barcelona, Spain. He was living in a tent near a large house stroke cabin, which was used as a commune for local bushcraft enthusiasts. At the time of his arrest, he was standing outside his tent chopping wood to keep his fire stoked. Joss was arrested by the police on the 26th of August, 2018, and he was extradited to the Netherlands on the 6th of September 2018 to stand trial for the sexually motivated killing of Nicky Verstappen. Joss Breck's trial began on the 28th of September 2020 and lasted for three weeks. Other than a brief statement during an earlier procedural hearing, Josh Breck exercised his right to silence and refused to answer any questions. The only thing he would break his silence for was to plead not guilty to all charges brought against him. In a pre-recorded video played in court, Josh stated that the only reason his DNA would be on Nikki's body was due to him checking the body for signs of life and due to him brushing leaves off the body. After this video message, the prosecutors told the court about 27 traces of DNA on Nikki's body and clothing that matched the suspect's profile. How could so many DNA traces be found on the body, including some on the inside of Nikki's underwear, be found if he was only checking for a pulse and had only brushed these leaves away? Another thing mentioned in the video was that Joss saw something in the distance from the edge of the forest where he was walking. He claimed to have been out doing his survivalist 
bullshite uh, when he had come across uh, Nikki's body. When the prosecution showed a reference photo for where Nikki was found, as well as where Joe stated he had been walking, it showed how it would not be physically possible for Joss to have been able to see the body. Joss would have had to have been walking a lot closer to the body for him to have just spotted it, as Nikki was obscured from view by trees. The prosecution deemed Joss's statements to be, quote, wafer thin and unbelievable, and the judge seemed to agree with these statements. At the end of the trial, Joss Breck was charged with possessing indecent images of minors and qualified manslaughter. He was sentenced to 12 years for qualified manslaughter and a further six months for the possession of indecent images of minors. After the trial, Nikki's mother, Berthy, spoke out and said that the family was, quote, relieved that after 22 years, it had been established that Joss did it. Even with the arrest of their child's killer, the Verstappen family will be making an appeal against the length of the sentence. They believe that 12 years and a half is not nearly enough time for Nikki's murderer and rapist to stay in prison. On the other hand, Joss's lawyer stated that Joss will also be lodging an appeal as he will not accept the punishment for a crime that he thinks he didn't commit, despite all this DNA evidence. Joss will be 69 when he will be released from prison and will be able to continue on with his life being a survivalist, whereas the Verstappen family will forever be haunted by the facts that they will never be able to see their little boy grow up. I, for one, cannot believe that for this obvious sexual assault rape of this 11-year-old boy and murder and then just abandoning the body and just the complete... I just can't believe that he's getting 12 years for qualified manslaughter. I mean, it would be very difficult to charge him with anything other than manslaughter, as you'd have to prove that it was um, murder in the first degree, murder in the second degree, premedita premeditated or not. Um, but 12 years for what he had done. And he wasn't even charged for the sexual assault on Nikki. He wasn't charged with anything connected to that. And then he got six months for possession of indecent images of children, which that in itself should be at least 10 years in prison. I'm not gonna lie, that's disg I'm getting really worked up, but I really hope that um, Nikki's family are able to get a much, much longer sentence for this absolute monster um, and keep him behind bars until he dies. And this is one of those cases where I hope that the prisoners and the inmates in the same prison as Joss know about what he has done and they, they serve justice for us in a way that I can't condone, but I hope they do, if you know what I mean, if you catch my drift, a little stabby stabby, you know? Let me know what you think of this case down in the comment section below. Make sure you're subscribed to this channel and that you've hit that bell icon so you can be notified every single time I post a brand new true crime video just like this one. Make sure you check out my merch. I'll put some pictures on the screen now. 10% of each purchase is being donated to the DNA Doe Project. This merch is not gonna be available for that much longer, so make sure you grab some ASAP Rocky. We've raised somewhere in the region of one and a half to $2,000 uh, for the DNA Doe Project, which we've been donating. Um, so thank you all so much for that. I wouldn't have been able to do that without you. And with all that being said, I'll see you in the next case.